Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation on 10 advanced IFR pro tips from the National Expert on Single Pilot IFR. For those of you joining us for the first time, Social Flight is the free web and mobile app dedicated to supporting general aviation. You can visit socialflight.com or, vi or download the Social Flight mobile app for Apple and Android devices, and that gives you free access to over 10,000 aviation events and destinations. Our mission is to give pilots more reasons to get out there and fly. Social Flight reaches over 100,000 pilots, helping them plan their next adventure. You'll even get a weekly email with a list of all the aviation events happening in your local area. So if you're not already a member, we certainly hope you'll check it out following the presentation. Before we get started for tonight's webinar, here's a few tips. Uh, we do have a lot of viewers tonight, which is wonderful. Some users on slower internet connections may have some issues viewing the presentation. If you have any issues or you just want to see the presentation again, a recording of tonight's presentation will be available on socialflight.com within 24 hours. We'll send you a link by email after the presentation. Feel free to post questions using the chat feature during the presentation, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, now, in addition to events you can fly to, uh, we also have online events, which is why we are all here today. Tonight's presentation is brought to you by Genesis Aerosystems, one of Social Flight's partners, and the reason that Social Flight remains a free service to pilots everywhere. I am personally a huge fan of the STEC Autopilot, and I can attest to their significant impact that they make on improving the safety of IFR flying. Our speaker this evening is Gary Reeves, a master flight instructor, Genesis national training partner, and well-known national speaker. Welcome to the Social Flight webinar series, Gary, and I will hand it over to you. Good evening, everybody. So PilotSafety.org is a volunteer group started eight years ago dedicated to reducing general aviation accidents by providing free and low-cost safety training for pilots. You can learn more anytime by going over to PilotSafety.org. Now, I normally don't read my own introduction, but I was having trouble with the movie file, so everyone do me a favor and just pretend this is a deeper voice that is trusting. PilotSafety.org really uh, speaks at every national convention, and we provide tons of free pilot resources. We absolutely just couldn't do it without help from Avemco, Avidyne, Genesis, and many other corporate sponsors. Our speaker today is me. Well, thank you. I guess I should talk a little bit. I promise you all, at least on paper, I look pretty smart. I have over 7,500 hours. I'm an X-135 professional pilot. I'm an ATP and I'm a master CFI, double I, and multi-engine instructor. Many people say, well, what's a master instructor? Well, there's 112,000 flight instructors in the United States, and less than 800 have ever been awarded the FAA-recognized master instructor award. In fact, they're so rare, I'm one of only nine for the state of Texas. I'm really great at about five things in life and not much else. I'm pretty good picking wines, but in addition to some wines, I'm really, really good at ForeFlight, Garmin, Avidyne Avionics, and single pilot IFR, especially using autopilots and technology. I was the 2016 FA Instructor of the Year for the entire Western United States. It's actually making me one of the top eight instructors in the U.S., and I've been uh, renominated this year for uh, the National Award. So everybody, please welcome me. I, you know, this actually sounds better when somebody else reads it. But just everyone, I'll just pretend you're all clapping at home. So this is actually a follow-up program to my IFR Made Easy. There are the 10 basic tips that make IFR easy. So tonight's class is really nothing to do with FAA regulations. Not that I don't want you to follow the FAA regulations. I'm a lead rep for the FAA safety team. I just don't care much about them. What I'm teaching you tonight is really how to reduce your workload and how to make IFR easier and safer. It's not so much for passing check rides. If you're studying for your IFR check ride, I think you should go visit my friend Jason Shepard over at m0a.com. He has the best online ground schools. This program is for anybody, students up through experienced instructors. 
I just want to make your workload less and make IFR easier. This is kind of an abbreviated version of my normal program, but if you've never seen my IFR made easy, or you'd like a longer, more detailed version of this with another three and a half hours of training, you can wander over to pilotsafety.org and we actually sell an entire IFR mastery program. So I am a huge believer in electronics. In my personal plane, I have an Avidine 550, the world's greatest GPS flight management system. It's got Jefferson charts. I have two iPads with ForeFlight Pro Plus, and they have Jefferson charts. I have Jefferson charts on an app on my iPhone, and I still print out paper charts for all four airports in every IFR flight plan because it's a matter of learning the system before you go fly. This is identical to reading a set of cliff notes before a test or making flashcards. And you can print out all of the approach plates by simply going over to AOPA.org. And if you click on airports, I'm searching here for Long Beach, which is my, uh, my ex-home field. I was based in Southern California most of my life. So I'm going to type in KLGB, and then I'm going to hit search. And I'm going to click on every possible procedure that I can legally shoot. One of the classic mistakes people do is they'll only mark up the chart they think they're going to get. And then the wind shifts, our runways closed, or your clearance changes, and you don't have the notes you need. So I need you to print out every possible standard instrument departure, standard terminal arrival route, and every instrument approach that your plane can legally shoot. So I've checked a bunch of them. And what I'm going to do is open them up as a PDF and drag them in the order I want and print them out. And I print them out so they full scale, meaning they fill the entire page because I'm turning 50 this year and got little eyes and I want to see them big. But people ask me, do I really print them out? Well, yeah, yeah, I really do. And here's a picture of these charts that I print out. And what I want you to do is I want you to highlight the important information, ignore the stuff that's not, and make notes. In fact, if you look at the holding pattern at patter, which is in the bottom left of the map, you'll notice that not only have I marked it up, but I've marked it up that I'm going to do a teardrop entry. And when I get there, I'm going to turn right to 176 to enter the pattern. So the time to figure out how you're going to enter a holding pattern on a missed approach is before you take off, not once you get there. How many of you were taught, or how many of you are flight instructors and you teach students to file IFR flight plans along Victor Airways or possibly jet routes? Please don't do that. Nobody wants you on a Victor Airway. You as a pilot, don't want to be on the Victor Airway. The air traffic controllers don't want you on Victor Airways. In fact, if you file Victor Airways or jet routes, you will get several times while flying, we have an amendment for your clearance, advise ready to copy. Because air route traffic control and route needs to keep a three mile bubble around every IFR airplane. And somebody is always faster than you or slower than you on the same route. The Victor Airways experience the equivalent of rush hour on a freeway. What I want you to do is get off the airways and go GPS direct. And by the way, that's what every air traffic controller in the country wants you to do too. You have GPS in your airplane. If you want to install a very great basic level system, Garmin makes very simplistic basic level GPS like a GTN which is beautiful. It's very touch screen, it's very pretty, it's very shiny. If you want an advanced flight management system, something that does all the work for you and you have to push 20 buttons plus an hour, well, all professional pilots install Avidine because it's much more than a basic level GPS. But either way, you have GPS. Get off the airways. So let's look at a basic Victor Airway route this is from my home airport in DFW, Texas. I live at the, a little tiny airport called Decatur, which is K-L-U-D, and I need up to go up to Wichita, Kansas, and say hi to Cessna. 
Well, if I file this Victor Airway, ATC will give it to me, but on this route, I get a minimum of two to three amendments to clearance and reroute in a two-and-a-half-hour flight every time. Sorry, I, it does take me two-and-a-half hours. I have a very nice airplane. It's a 1966 Cessna 206 that is paid for, and it's a beautiful airplane. It has an Avidine stack, has an Aspen panel. I'm putting the Genesis 3100 in it, and I still can't make it any faster. Uh, I only get about 130 knots. So on the Victor Airway routes, I'm constantly getting reroutes because I think I'm always in somebody else's way. So what I want you to do is when I want you to zoom in, really what I'd like you to do is simply file to the nearest VOR that's somewhere along your route. So the VOR nearest to me is Ardmore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my route and file GPS direct to the nearest VOR. You need to do this because you always need to be ready for a GPS outage. Always. GPS outages happen every single day all over the United States. So you're going to file to the nearest VOR, and then you're going to file direct to the initial approach fix of the procedure you're going to shoot when you land. So let me show you what I mean by this. I'm going to reroute myself, KLUD, the Ardmore VOR, direct to the Wichita Airport. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch the Wichita Airport with my finger, and I'm going to look at the METAR. And the METAR says the winds are coming out of the south. Well, you always know what procedure you're going to shoot when you get there. One of the things I talk about every time I speak nationally, and I've been teaching IFR for 16 years, is people say, well, I don't know what procedure I'm going to shoot until I hear the ATIS. Well, that's not correct. You, all professional pilots know what procedure they're going to shoot four hours before they take off. We can read a TAF. We can read a MOS. I pick the procedure I want to shoot before I take off. I don't wait for the ATIS to tell me the ILS is in use. I know the ILS is in use, but I want to shoot an RNF. So what I do is I'm going to check the TAF just to make sure that the winds are going to be constant. And by the way, this works all the time. In the last five years of teaching all over the United States, I've taught in 30 of the 50 states in the last two years, I've only had to change procedures once. And that's because somebody geared up on a runway and I needed just to switch to another runway. So it looks like the wind's going to be out of the south all day long. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up the approaches and I'm going to select the RNAV Yankee for one niner left. And what I'm going to do is on four flight, I'm going to push on the map button. So this doesn't load the procedure. You can't file a procedure in your flight plan. What I want to do is just overlay the map so I can pick my initial approach fix. So what I do is I just drag the blue line up to the intermediate fix or initial approach fix of JAXU. And when I do, an insert into route will pop up. I'm going to click on waypoints. And then I'm going to click on JAXU. This is what I file. And by the way, this works everywhere. I fly all over the country, and this always works. Of course, there are exceptions to every rule. If you are near a very busy Bravo airspace, Newark, JFK, Boston, SoCal Approach, NorCal Approach, DFW, SeaTac, you must file the SIDS and the STARS in and out of the Bravo, then you file GPS direct in between. So if I've seen several comments that, well, people don't allow GPS direct. No, that's absolutely not true. DC, Baltimore, Philly, New York, SoCal Approach, which is the last of the super Cracons, it's actually six Cracons in one. They handle two million airplanes a year. They'll absolutely give you an IFR clearance with GPS direct, but, because the Victor Airways are so congested and they come together so closely that somebody near the Bravo Airport going GPS direct will actually block several other Victor Airways, you actually just need to be on the SIDS and the STARS in and out, and then go GPS direct in between. 
So that's the exception. Now, don't activate vectors to final on your box. One of the greatest GPSs ever invented was something called the Garmin 430 and the Garmin 530. It really kind of changed the world. I love Garmin. I love the Garmin GTN. I love the Garmin 430, 530. It really kind of changed the world. Unfortunately, people got used to not loading the procedure before they got there. They would just hit a procedure button, and then they'd activate vectors to final. Professional pilots don't activate vectors to final. I don't want you to either. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't accept vectors to final. I think everyone in here probably pays for their own gas. I think a lot of people in this room rent an airplane. When you're renting an airplane and you're paying 150 or 160 bucks an hour, or you own your own airplane and you're paying $100 an hour for gas, if a trade con controller says, would you like vectors to final and save 10 minutes worth of rental and fuel? Take it and run, yes. Absolutely, I take it too. But I want you to not activate vectors to find on the box. I'll show you why. It causes problems. So let's look at a localizer DME 2-4 approach in Fullerton, a very common approach. The problem with vectors to final is that it deletes every waypoint except the final and simply draws a 30 nautical mile magenta leg. So even if you have the best GPS system on, on, on the planet for general aviation, which is Avidine, and, and all these, of course, are just my opinions only, it's a true flight management system. The problem is it deletes all the other waypoints. So you may be missing critical safety step-down features, or how many of you have had this happen to you? A controller will give you vectors to final. You'll take the shortcut because you're smart, and then they say, oh, I'm sorry, jet cut you off. I need you to go back to the initial. Well, now it's not there anymore. Now your flight plan has big gaps in route. You have to reload the procedure at a busy point in life. Well, here's what you should do, and here's why I don't want you to activate vectors to final. Remember, I want you to take vectors to final. I just don't want you to program it that way. On the final approach course, outside of zero, you are required to be at or above 3,000 feet. Outside Hammond, you are required to be at or above 2,500 feet. You can only step down to 2,000 feet, at or above 2,000, when you're between QD and Hammock. Well, here's the problem. If you activate vectors to final, you delete Hammock and zero. So here's an Avidine 550, and I'm gonna do it incorrectly. I'm gonna load the procedure from vectors. And now, I've been put on a heading, and SoCal Approach says, Station Air 49 or 401 Foxtrot, turn left heading 270, maintain 3000 till established, cleared for the localizer DME 24 Fullerton. And I intercept the final approach course right where you see my airplane hit. Great. I don't know when I can descend because I've eliminated Hammock. I no longer know when I can descend to 2500. I don't know when I can descend to 2000. Now I'm just stuck there, or I have to count the distance countdown while looking at a paper chart and do math. Look, I'm great at math, but I don't do it while I'm flying the airplane. So I put on synthetic vision, and uh, only the Avidine has synthetic vision. Garmin's do not. Garmin's have really cool features that Avidine doesn't. Garmin has uh, visual approaches to all charted runways. It, they get some neat features, but they don't have synthetic vision. It's an Avidine-only thing or if you want like a G1000 or G3000, they have synthetic vision. So this is the 550, and now I switch to the full AR view, and I still don't know when I can step down. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to always load the full approach and then activate the leg to final. So if you load the full approach, and this is a Jefferson chart again, it looks like an Avidine 550, what you want to do is you just want to go to FMS, select QD, which is labeled Final Approach Fix. And by the way, on Garmin GTNs, it has a very similar marking. On a Garmin 430, it'll say FAF as well. I'm going to touch that, and then I'm going to hit Activate Leg. 
If you're using any Garmin technologies, it's just harder. Garmin just requires extra button pushes for everything. So what you would do is you'd highlight it, and if you have a Garmin 43530 GTN or G1000 series, you're going to push the direct to button twice and then enter once. And that will now activate the leg to final, but leave all the other waypoints in your flight plan and all the other waypoints on your map. So now you know when to legally step down. The only time I'd like you to activate vectors final is, of course, if you have an emergency. Another IFR pro tip is I'd like you to practice, and you should do it with a master instructor. It went more out there. But do it with somebody who has a lot of experience doing this because I don't know if you all remember, but when I was taught IFR and when I used to teach IFR, I owned a big flight school in Los Angeles, the nightmare that we taught everybody was vacuum failure. Oh, my gosh. If your vacuum system fails, now you have to sticky note and you got to do partial panel approaches. No. Mayday, 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 vector yourself to a VFR airport. That's how you get out of partial panel. But vacuum system failures aren't the biggest nightmare, especially for glass panel airplanes. You're flying along at night or in IMC and you have a total electrical failure. Now you have no navigation and no communication. All of a sudden the vacuum pump thing seems pretty simplistic. If you're flying along at night and your whole panel goes dark, or your IMC and your whole panel goes dark, are you gonna dead reckon to what you thought was the nearest VOR and then dead reckon a VOR approach? Y'all, I don't know, that, that just sounds like a ton of dead. Can you legally use an iPad program like ForeFlight? Well, in an emergency, you can use anything you want. You can do it, it just takes a little bit of training. So you're flying along, everything looks great, and all of a sudden, your whole panel goes dark. This is why I want you to use ForeFlight. Now, if you have a Garmin GTN, you can buy a Garmin flight stream, so it reports its position, and you can share flight pens up and down to Garmin Pilot or ForeFlight. Great, I don't want you to do that. If you have an Avidyne system, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are built in for free, and you can connect it to ForeFlight or FlightQ. I, yeah, I don't want you to do that. I never want ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot or WingX or FlightQ or any of the great programs connected to my panel mount GPS. I keep my ForeFlight locked on a Stratus 2S or a Stratus 3 in the back of the plane so that if I lose my panel, I have a completely independent backup system with traffic, weather, and a full AHARS. So I've cut out the movies for this presentation, but how many of you, if you had a Stratus 2S or a Stratus 3 connected that gives you a full AHARS, now it gives you a GPS ground speed, not an airspeed. It gives you a GPS altitude, not an indicated altitude. But how many of you with a little bit of practice, this kind of looks like a little G1000, doesn't it? How many of you with a little bit of practice could hand fly this approach? You're flying along, you get a little closer to Woodstock, everything looks great, you've got full synthetic vision. We're descending. Now at Woodstock, you can see my course switches. I'm just gonna follow the pink line now, of course. At this point, your iPad will give you the 10% warning. Wow, that's kind of normal, but now we turn and we can descend down to 3,000 and you can see how I've marked up my four flight charts. Flying along, coming up on Lucy. And by the way, Woodstock, Lucy, and Pigpen are at the Charles Schultz Airport or Santa Rosa where you can get some really good wine. As I pass Lucy, I can now descend to 2200 in fact it is so good that as I get closer to Santa Rosa if I had to break off to do a circling approach I actually could extend a traffic pattern on four flight follow it in with synthetic vision 
And by the way, I offer a three-day mastery, uh, IFR mastery program, where I'll come to you anywhere in the country, or you can come play, and we'll actually go land at Dallas, Fort Worth, and go in and out of Oklahoma City. If you want to be great at IFR, I have a three-day program for that. But after three days and 20 hours of training, I'm going to let you take the plane all the way down to 100 feet AGL under a hood, just using four flight and a strata. And you can see how good it looks all the way in. Okay, because we filed a flight plan that includes the initial approach fix, before you take off, you should load the approach. So the biggest problem people have with all Garmin and Avidan avionics and King avionics is something called a giggle error. If you put garbage in a computer, y'all, you're going to get garbage out. So let me run a scenario by you and see if this makes sense. Would you file and fly the airplane to your destination airport and then leave, go back out, and shoot an instrument approach? That doesn't make sense. So if you load a flight plan to an airport and then hit the procedure button, you're going to have a gap in route. You're going to have to manually activate the approach. Well, if you put your flight plan to an initial approach fix, and then your destination, and then you load a procedure from that initial approach fix on any Garmin or Avidyne GPS, the approach will self-activate when you get there. Let me show you how to do it. So here's a flight plan from Long Beach to LAX Ventura into Santa Barbara. Well, I know, because I've already checked the weather, that I'm going to do the GPS 2.5 into Santa Barbara, and that starts from an initial approach fix called Quang. So I'm just going to put all of that in. So on four flight, because Quang was already in there, this is the exact same way I'm going to program it into an Avidyne or Garmin GPS. So here's an Avidyne 550. And what I do is I just put in the flight plan, including Quang. Then I hit the procedure button. Then I load the GPS from 2.5. Avidyne backfills it, and poof, it'll self-activate it. Now, here's a professional-level tip that most people don't know. On all Garmin and Avidyne avionics, after the missed approach point, your flight plan's not done. You should continue your flight plan in a navigation log that you've already created to your alternate. The biggest difference is, is Garmin suspend when you pass the missed approach point. So as you're going around, you're going to have to unsuspend and hit activate GPS approach. Garmin only allows one instrument approach loaded in all flight plans. Avidyne never suspends. There is no suspend mode on an Avidyne. Avidyne automatically auto sequences through the mist. And if you put in a flight plan of 300 airports, you can have 300 instrument procedures preloaded. It's not that Garmin's not great. It's just a simple level GPS and Avidyne's flight management. But what you all need to do is continue your flight plan. So let me show you what it looks like when it's preloaded. And you can see that Quang has now changed to initial approach fix. It's never going to ask you if you want to activate the approach because you've already done it. So what I want you to do and what I want you to take from this class and it's a little bit of an abbreviated class, and I'm talking really fast, is everything you can do to put more work on the ground and less work while flying the airplane. And once you get there, it'll just self-activate. So as we're flying, the LPV, and this is a synthetic vision on an on Avidyne 550, it self-activates, and now I'm holding at the mist. But because on all GPS, including the King Touchscreen 770, by the way, you can continue your flight plan when you're holding it go at the mist approach, Santa Barbara approach is going to say, stay in tension. Well, I would like to continue to my alternate of San Luis Obispo via Victor 27, say big, and I've got the ATIS, and we're going to shoot the R and F29. Then all you have to do is hit the exit hold button, 
and Abidine will say, exiting the hold it fixed, and automatically continue to your alternate, and automatically self-activate that approach while you're there. Okay, so this is kind of a common error, and it's actually fairly critical. This is especially important uh, if you own your own airplane or if you rent. You are legally required every time you update data from flight.garmin.com or, you know, we use Jeppesen. After you upload your Jeppesen database and after, or after you download your new Jeppesen database or after you update your new Garmin database, you are legally required to check for bad data. Both Jeppesen and Avidine buy their data from the FAA. And then the FAA says, by the way, there's errors in the data. Or sometimes Jeppesen or Garmin will find errors in the data through their own self-check program. So there may be procedures loaded in your database that are illegal and unsafe to use. So whenever you update, and I'm just going to show you a Jeppesen screen, what you're going to do is you're going to check for alerts. And what you're going to do is you're just going to check for alerts by clicking alerts and notices. Now, students, if you're renting an airplane anywhere, you can actually go to jeppesen.com or flight.garmin.com for free. You don't need an account. Before you fly an airplane, figure out what database is in there and check for bad data. And is it really critical? Well, yeah. Here's a current jab, uh, here's a current jab of some nav data saying the localizer frequency is incorrect. So if you have a Garmin and you activate this ILS, it will put the localizer frequency in standby and then you'd flip it forward. If you have an Avidine, it's just automatically going to stick in the primary. But the problem is, is both devices will auto load an incorrect frequency because it's bad data in the database and you're not supposed to shoot this procedure. But if you don't know, you wouldn't. So I get this question a lot. People say, well, I get a standard weather briefing. Well, great, you should. You're legally required to get a standard weather briefing before every single flight that leaves the traffic pattern of your home airport. That's 91103, and it's considered careless and reckless 9113 if you don't. By the way, who's the person most often violates not getting a flight for anything? A flight instructor. Come on, right? Like we, it's our fourth flight of the day. It's still blue skies. It's been blue skies all day, and we're just going to the practice area. Yeah, I know. But you really need to do it before every trip. And then people say, well, I get a standard weather briefing, and sometimes they hit the briefing button on four flight, or sometimes they'll go to 1-800-WXBrief.com, or you'll use Flight Plan Go, or Garmin, or FlightQ, or whatever. It's never going to have this data. Standard weather briefings do not include avionics database because it's not turned in as a NOTAM. So you have to check the manufacturer's site. Okay, so if anybody's ever seen me at a convention, I'm a big fan of GPS. In fact, if you want to find me, just look for Gary's pink shirt or follow God pink source. I want you always on the magenta line. GPS is much more accurate. Autopilots like it better. In fact, many of the low-cost autopilots that you can buy only track GPS. They won't work at all with URs or localizers. I always want you on GPS, but the problem is, is you still need to program VORs in the background. You still need to always keep the nearest VOR tuned in because... We have GPS testing notams every single day. In fact, I saw a question from somebody earlier that says they fly in the Pacific Northwest. Boeing, the world's largest defense contractor, actually turns off, or I'm sorry, not turns, but they did disable GPS WAS and SB for a 200 nautical mile radius around SeaTac Airport one day without issuing notams because it's required as part of our national defense structure. You always need to be ready. In the last year, I've flown over 400 hours from everywhere from Alaska to Boston to Florida and everywhere in between. And three to four times a year in IFR doing a GPS approach, 
I will get a little blink on a Garmin or Avidyne unit that says GPS position lost. Well, there's nothing wrong with your unit. The military testing no cams can be up to 800 nautical miles wide, and it's usually a momentary interruption. But that's why I taught you earlier, always program to the nearest VOR after takeoff. So if you take off and lose GPS, you can head towards a VOR and then resume a VOR uh, or Victor Airway. All right, wrapping it up pretty close here, but I want to talk to you and how many of you were taught an instrument scan? So one of my really good friends, Jason Schaffer, he owns M0A.com. He has, I think, the greatest IFR ground school, and there's a scans mentioned like an inverted V, and there's like a silent Q, and I don't know. Rob Machado is absolutely one of my favorite authors. John and Martha King are personal friends of mine. I think I grew up watching the sporties videos. And every instructor I've ever met teaches an instrument scan. Well, I think you should learn an instrument scan to pass your instrument check ride because your examiner is probably going to ask. But in my opinion only, I think they're a total waste of time, and I think they're mostly ineffective because I believe that people, when they scan more than one instrument in five or six seconds, don't see any of it because their eyes are bouncing like ping pong balls. They're checking so many gauges, they're not actually registering any of it. So what I'd like to do is completely forget the scan. I'd like you all to adopt a Gary method. My spirit animal, by the way, is actually the sloth. And it's not that I'm lazy, I just want to expend the least amount of energy I possibly can. So instead of checking six gauges in five seconds, I check two. All I really need to do is check my attitude indicator plus one. Let's play true or false. If you're in the stable weather, not moderate turbulence or thunderstorms, if the plane is trimmed for level flight and you make no power changes, airspeed, altitude, and vertical speed won't change. True or false? Well, it's absolutely true. So, I can pretty much just remove those gauges. I don't need any of them. True or false? If your attitude indicator is level and you have no electrical or vacuum failure, your heading will stay the same. I'm not talking about ground track, nobody bring up crosswind. I'm talking about your heading, true or false. Well, that's true as well. So I don't really need a compass. True or false, if you know the bank angle for standard rate, you don't need a turn indicator. Everybody, I want you to memorize a couple bank angles. If you fly a 172 or 152, your standard rate at 90 knots is 13 degrees, and that goes for most of the Cherokee people. You fly something a little bit bigger, like a Piper Dakota, uh, 206, a 182, your standard rate at 120 knots is 18 degrees. And you got something bigger, faster than that, 150 is 22 degrees. So if you just know what speed you're shooting an approach at, you don't need the turn coordinator at all because you can memorize a couple angles. A standard rate turn for every airplane ever built doing 90 knots is 13 degrees. I don't need to check a turn coordinator to know I'm standard rate. If I'm doing an approach at 120 knots for every airplane ever built, it's going to be 18 degrees. And if you're shooting an approach at 150 knots because you're flying a, a turbine Bonanza or a Premier Jet or something flashy, well, then all you got to remember is 22 degrees. So if we memorize those three rates, or really y'all just need to memorize one, well, we can just get rid of that one too. So instead of scanning all six of those gauges, that you don't really need, I want you to look at the attitude indicator for three to five seconds, and then pick one gauge to double check that everything is still good. Go back to the attitude indicator for a full three seconds. Check one gauge, are you still on course? Go back to the attitude indicator, three full seconds. 
Is your airspeed still correct? If you've not made any power changes and your airspeed has changed, why? Are you picking up ice? Are you in downdraft? Back to the attitude indicator. GPS is good. Back to the attitude indicator. Don't forget to check for vacuum and oil pressure failures. Back to the attitude indicator. If you'll adopt my method of attitude plus one, you'll be amazed in a three-hour hand-flown IFR trip how much more energized you feel at the end and how much less tired you are. Now, one of the common things I hear when I train students is I ask, well, if you have a, an emergency after takeoff in IMC, what are you going to do? They say, well, I'm going to come back to this airport. Well, that may not be the best method. In red, if I take off Long Beach 3-0 and I have an emergency after takeoff in IMC, like a rough running engine or somebody's really sick or there's smoke in the cabin, by the time I circle back following the red route to re-vector myself for an ILS 3-0, I may be in the air for 12 minutes or longer. It's a much better idea for me just to continue straight, make a right and a left, and land at LAX. So before I take off, I'm going to overlay the LAX approach plate on four flight. And you'll notice I've marked up all of my headings, all the towers and all the frequencies. And before I take off, I'm going to preload the ILS frequency and make it active in NAV1. Is it legal to vector yourself onto an ILS at Los Angeles International Airport using four flight in an emergency? Well, yeah, anything's legal in an emergency. And then I can flip the VLOC, say mayday, 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 I'm landing two five left, they'll scatter everybody, and this is a better idea. Another thing I'd like you to do is change your expectations. Professional pilots never plan to land. Garmin GPS units suspend because they expect you to land. All professional pilots never expect to land. They expect to go miss. That's why Avidine auto sequences. It's just a difference in philosophy. So don't plan to land, plan to go miss. So expectation bias is the tendency for pilots to believe and act on signs that agree with their expectations for completing a flight, and to disbelieve or ignore signs that appear to suggest otherwise. And by the way, expectation bias only happens to good pilots. Harrison Ford, when he lined up on a taxiway in Santa Ana, expected to land. He's a very good pilot. He does a lot for safety, but he expected to land. He expected the pappies to be on the right. Well, none of those things were true at Santa Ana, but that's a classic case of expectation bias. So here's a story from a air, uh, an airline transport pilot a, a pilot, a very experienced pilot, who almost killed himself. I have many hours and many approaches to minimums as a single pilot, but have, ver have flown very few missed approaches. Based upon the terminal area that forecast, and current weather at time of the approach, I expected to break out well above minimums. How many of you online tonight are married? You know most fights in a marriage are caused by expectations. You expect to go out for Chinese. They expect to go out for a hamburger, and boom, now you're fighting about what's for dinner. Well, he expected to break out well above minimums. He looked up fully expecting to see the runway in sight for continuation and landing. However, any flight instructor on the webinar, hi guys, and thank you so much, uh, or gals, thank you all so much for being here. A professional flight instructor never stops learning. My buddy Jason Shepard at M0A says a good pilot's always learning. Here at Pilot Safety, we say a true master never stops reviewing the basics. So thank you all so much for being here. Uh, you inspire me, uh, and I think you all are great flight instructors. But flight instructors on the, the call tonight will recognize that if a pilot turns his head to the left or the right, their hand will follow. I saw nothing of the runway environment. I just knew that my skills would allow me to land as they had many times. I leveled off at the MDA while looking outside the cockpit for the runway. 
He turned his head to the left. It just had to be there. I began an uncontrolled, unconscious, 90-degree bank to the left, still looking for the runway environment. He recovered at just under 100 feet, scared himself silly. Now, obviously, he made it because he wrote the report, but that's a classic example of expectation bias. You should be surprised when you see the airport. You should expect to go mess. Now, you all want to see something really cool, and this is something I just recently added to my airplane. One of the hardest things about single pilot IFR is you all tend to play whack-a-mole. Anybody remember the old whack-a-mole game? What happens is the pilot will look at their G5 or G500, G600, or I have an Aspen panel or a dining panel, or maybe you're looking at a good old-fashioned attitude indicator. Then you turn your head to the right and you look at a GPS. Then you stick your head up like whack-a-mole, look over the glare shield, don't see an airport, you go back to the panel, you go back to the GPS, whack-a-mole, stick your head up, look for an airport. It's exhausting. What if you could just look out the windshield the entire time? Well, there's a company called Epic Optics that makes the only HUD available for general aviation focused at infinity. And what that means is it's so cool that Textron Aviation, the people who make Cessna and Beach, are hardwiring it to the G1000 that they're producing starting in 2019. But you can go out and buy one today for just a little under $2,000 and put it in your airplane. And this is what I have in my airplane. So I was flying along in Oklahoma City, and I was exhausted, hand-flying my poor airplane, seven hours of flying and going around thunderstorms, and I had a vacuum failure, and I didn't know I had a vacuum failure. Now, I check my vacuum gauge every 15, 20 minutes, but I honestly don't know when it failed because I don't look down at my panel very much at all. Now, this is something only available with an Avidyne 550, an Aspen panel, and an Epic Optics HUD. What it's actually doing is it's airplane, the Avidyne IFD 100 app, onto my windshield. And how good is it? Well, this is what you get. You get a total velocity vector, and you get pilots on there like TVBs. You get an indicated airspeed, an indicated airspeed trend. I have a lateral CDI, a vertical CDI, a desired track, a barrel corrected altitude, and a vertical speed trend. Now, this is only available with Avidyne 550, an Aspen or an, another air data computer, and the Avidyne IFD 100 app. If you don't have an Avidyne, it's okay. Garmin makes great stuff. You can actually airplay force flight up on instead, or you could airplay Garmin pilot up. The only thing is, is this is an aid to situational awareness only. It's not legally considered the PFD, and don't forget, if you're airplane for flight, the Stratus app, Garmin pilots, like you, whatever, you're going to get GPS altitude, GPS ground speed, and you're not going to get lateral and vertical CVI. So it's not as precise. If there are any military pilots out there tonight, thank you so much for your service. And I guarantee you every military pilot right now is drooling, and it's epic optics because they're going to run out and they're going to be the first one to buy one. So I have a favorite quote from Albert Einstein, y'all. The difference between genius and stupidity is genius has its limits. Well, I'm going to tweak that and give you a Gary quote. The difference between genius and stupidity is that genius knows the limitations of their autopilot. I think you've probably heard other well-known national public speakers say that people should hand fly more. I think you've probably read articles in the major magazines and on Facebook that people should hand fly more. Well, y'all, I, I think I've been authentic enough with you. And by authentic, I mean I'm just me. I'm a guy that's taught IFR for 14, 15, 16 years. I'm a guy who does this for a living. And I'm going to be 100% authentic with you in that I never want you to hand fly at all. I can take a six-year-old child up on a young eagle flight, and they can hold an altitude in the heading. At 200 feet after takeoff, I want my autopilot flying the plane. And I want an autopilot that can fly me all the way down to a decision altitude. I never want you to hand fly because it's the easiest part of flying. Professional pilots don't concentrate on holding a heading and an altitude. 
professional pilots let autopilots do this simple stuff, and we manage big picture. I'm getting weather 50, 100, 200 miles out. I'm looking outside for traffic, not staring at a traffic display. I'm making diversion decisions. I'm running checklists. So once a month, I'd like you to turn off your autopilot and go hand fly a VOR DME radio to a VOR non-precision circle land approach with an instructor or safety pilot. I want you to be able to hand fly an emergency, but it's exhausting and it's actually not as safe as a professional pilot using an autopilot if you understand your autopilot. So King used to own the world. Y'all remember when King was the, the big gorilla? And they made some great autopilots. And I think everybody's probably familiar with a Cap 140 or 150. But there's some critical limitations. There is an entire pre-flight procedure that must be performed before every flight. It is limited to a max speed of 140. You can never have it turned on below 70. You cannot do approaches less than 80. You cannot have the autopilot engaged if the flap extension is more than 10 degrees, and it is never allowed to be turned on after takeoff below 800 feet, and of course you have to turn it off at decision altitude. An STEC 55X, one of my favorite autopilots ever, it's made by Genesis, well, it's a little bit better. It has a max speed of 185, but did you know in an SR-22 that there is a maximum crosswind of 12 knots between the final approach rates and the missed approach point. Otherwise, you're going to have to hand fly. Now, the minimum approach speed is much lower. It's 1.2 times stalling speed dirty. You can go up to 50% flat, but you must disconnect at more than 50% of deflection, and it is not allowed to be turned on below 400 feet after takeoff, and, of course, you have to descend. So the King Autopilot, you can turn on at 800 feet, the s 55 you can turn on at 400 feet, and it works in bigger areas. Trio ProPilot. Now, this is one of these very uh, new low-cost autopilots, and I think low-cost autopilots like the Trio and the True Track are great because I think any autopilot is better than no, no autopilot. But there is a reason lower-cost autopilots are lower cost. It is... GPS only. They can never track a VOR or localizer. Flight instructors can't fly the plane from the right. If you're flying alone, I know you got to move over to the left. There's a minimum speed of 75 knots. There's a max fuel imbalance, and you're not allowed to turn it on below 800 feet. Now, Garmin just released a new series of autopilots, and I think they're really good. Uh, there's a GFC-5 and a GFC-600. However, they require a G5 display, a G500, G600, or a GAD29. So if you buy a new Garmin GTN, which is uh, the best basic level GPS you can buy, and you go buy a G500, they won't work unless you buy a converter box in between. Uh, there's a minimum speed of 75 knots. There's a maximum balance of uh, 50, uh, 15 gallons. You have to disconnect at 50% deflection, and you are not allowed to turn them on below 800 feet after takeoff. But the only thing that bothers me about this, and Garmin makes such great stuff, is there's a hidden nanny mode that just scares me to death. When the autopilot is turned off, if you pull up too hard, push down too hard, or try and turn too sharp, the autopilot will turn itself on and try and correct you. Flight instructors, the most dangerous thing on the planet is two people trying to fly the same plane, and this thing just scares me to death. I get it for low time VFR pilots. I think it's kind of a neat feature because it could prevent, help prevent the stall spin on landing for low time VFR pilots. I think that's kind of a cool thing, but it terrifies me as a single pilot IFR. I'm coming in, I disconnect an approach at traffic pattern altitude, and I break off to enter traffic pattern on a 45 degree angle on a clear day at a non towered field, which you should. Somebody cuts me off, I pull up hard to the left, and it tries to roll my nose back down towards the target. I push the disconnect button, and it stays engaged. You have to hold the disconnect button down for five continuous seconds before it cuts off. Now, look, you can overpower it, but I think it'd be a big distraction. Great autopilot, but you need to know limitations. The autopilot I'm putting in my airplane is not the TrueTrack. Sorry, it was a slide behind. There's a TrueTrack Vision. I think it's very good. 
Now, something interesting about the true track vision is it's never allowed before below 700 feet AGL. That is on takeoff or landing or instrument approach. So not only is it GPS only, fine, great, I want you on GPS, but if you're shooting a GPS LPV approach, you cannot continue down to 200 feet DA. You must hand fly the last 500 feet. It sounds worse than it is. I think you should all be able to do that. This is what I'm putting in my airplane. I'm putting in the STEC 3100. It's off for takeoff and landing. The max, flap, the max flap extension in the 210 is 10 degrees, but I can turn it on at 200 feet. I can disengage at 200 feet. There is no hidden nanny mode, but it still has the level button, which several new autopilots have. So if you were ever taught unusual attitude recovery, it was probably something like disconnect autopilot and pair. Power, ailerons, rudder, elevator. Or just push the level button. I was delivering a uh, pressurized Cessna 320 uh, with two brand new Ram 7 engines for some friends and I was taking it into Santa Fe. And I said, well, you wanna see something cool? And at 21,000 feet, I kicked it over. I got permission from ATC first. I kicked it down to 45 degree left bank and 30 degrees nose down, let it stabilize in a pretty good steep spiral, push the level button, put the power to middle, and it went blink, perfect horizon level in about five seconds. It just flipped. Now several autopilots have this level button and it really makes a difference. It really, really does. This is the button that could have saved a lot of people. Now, Remember I said you gotta know your limitations. So if you really wanna be an IFR master, y'all, you need to understand all of your avionics. You have to read the pilot's operating guide for whatever GPS you put in your airplane. Please don't forget to read your autopilot handouts too and the most complex powerful glass panel system ever available for flight mobile. How many of you, if you learned in a steam gauge airplane, would let your friends or student or yourself fly a G1000 airplane if you watched a couple YouTube videos and you played the button while you were flying? It would be really dangerous. The biggest, well, one of the biggest problems we have today is that the new avionics are not self-teachable. You need to read all 400 pages of the owner's manual and go work with a master instructor who specializes in avionics. 15 years ago, y'all, and how many of you out there have been flying for more than 15, 20 years? We could get in any airplane on the planet and we could teach ourselves the radio. The new Garmin G10 is not self-teachable. The new Avidine systems are not self-teachable. And for flight is not self-teachable. Most people around the country that have a very good GPS, a very good autopilot, and a very good glass panel system on an iPad. Only know about 30% of the features and don't know most of the emergency procedures. Well, if you're not a big fan of reading, don't worry about it. Go on over to pilotsafety.org and that's what I do for a living. And what's really interesting is if you look at the G1000, the most complex glass panel, a great system, one of the best things Garmin's ever done for aviation, my G1000 perspective training videos are six hours. My four flight videos are over eight and a half because four flight does so much more. If y'all have any help, you wanna ask me a question anytime for free, head on over to pilotsafety.org, click on ask the experts, you can send me a question. If you wanna be great at IFR single pilot, you really wanna be pushed. You wanna go land at DFW in a GA airplane, you want to go in and out of Oklahoma City, you want to land using four flight only, you want to see a heads up display, you want 20 hours of training, come hang out with me in Dallas, Texas for three days or about once, uh, maybe six to 10 times next year, I'll actually be available to come to you and work with you in your airplane. And that's everything we cover. I would like to invite you all to write down this website it's http colon forward slash forward slash bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash aviation mastery. 
My very good friend Jason Shepard and I are going to do a special two-day convention just for pilots in Orlando, Florida, and it's everybody from student pilots all the way up to ATPs, and go to that website, and we'd be happy to have you. One of the greatest things, though, is that uh, Genesis has actually hired me to develop free training videos for all of their autopilots starting with the 3100. So if you have any Genesis as tech autopilot, there'll actually be a free 45 minute to hour introductory training video on this website. It's sponsored by Genesis and it's because they believe in safety and they want pilots to know how to work them. So you can actually go over to autopilot.guide now and check out the free 3100 video. Within the next four months, there'll be training videos on all of their autopilots this is something Genesis has done. This is why they asked me to be on the webinar tonight and why they sponsored it, along with another great partner in safety, Social Flight. So if you all have any questions, I'm happy to answer a few now as long as my voice lends out. Does anybody have any questions that you all would like me to answer? So Gary, thank you so much for your time. We just had a couple of questions. People can add some in the chat section if you have them, uh, since we're at the end of our time. One question that's posted, if you could repeat the Garmin URL to check errors um, on, uh, uh, in the data. Absolutely. It's flight, F-L-I-T-E dot Garmin dot com. If I didn't get that right, there's a Garmin user. If you can type it in the chat box, that'd be great. But I believe it's flight dot Garmin dot com. Okay, and the other thing you had mentioned, uh, you, you uh, made an approach plate go away in for flight after you've loaded the approach as part of the nav route. Can you explain how you made that go away? Right, so after I've overflied LAX and I no longer need the emergency procedure, there's a little sheriff's badge icon, a little wheel with spokes in the top left of the approach plate. I simply touch that and hit hide plate. Excellent. Well, Gary, thank you again. It is, I can tell you as an, as an attendee as well, it is absolutely fascinating to learn from you. I'm looking at my calendar as, as we speak to see if I can make it down there to your two-day mastery course because I'm, I'm dying to learn more from you. And I really appreciate you taking the time this evening. And, of course, thank you so much to Genesis for uh, making this evening possible and uh, for the really outstanding autopilots that keep us all safe when we're flying single pilot IFR, as you mentioned. I uh, really, really love those products and looking forward to potentially doing something with my own aircraft at some point. So thank you all for joining us. Now, most importantly, a recording will be available of tonight's presentation. And uh, we will send out an email with a link to that recording. Anyone who had any issues at all with uh, being able to join us for tonight's presentation, we will make sure that you get to watch the recording at your convenience in order to see all the valuable information that Gary's provided. So again, for Social Flight, I'm Jeff Simons. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Genesis. Thank you, Gary. And have a wonderful evening.